بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. This is the second episode on the series on why sincere questions, sincere answers. Today's question is: If God exists, why doesn't He show Himself to us? Let's go back to our previous episode. In the previous episode, we began by asking the question: Can we ask God why? Are we even allowed to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a why question? We saw in that episode that the angels asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created, he told the angels that he was going to place a vice gerent, a representative on earth, human beings. The angels, they said, will you make therein one who will do corruption there and shed blood while we declare your transcendence with praise and call you holy? We saw in the previous episode that the angels, they asked with sincerity. And we saw that what's important is not the question that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or ask about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or ask about his religion. What's important is not the question, but what's important is how we ask. We need to ask with sincerity. We saw that sincerity in asking why is to ask as a slave would ask. Like these circles of people prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the Kaaba. And we saw that sincerity in asking means that when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or about his religion, we ask in the spirit of I am weak and incapable, just like these millions of worshippers who are prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask in the spirit of I am your slave and I'm trying. And we ask in the spirit of I need your help. Help me find the answer to this question. So what uh, we saw that, that the, the, the guiding um, verse is the verse in Surah Al-Fatiha, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You alone do we worship and your help alone do we seek. So this is the verse in the spirit of which we're going to try and pose all of our questions. So if you look at the question um, that is the topic of this episode, um, if God exists, why doesn't he show himself to us? Um, let's try and see if we can fit it into the spirit of You alone do we worship and your help alone do we seek. So let's analyze this question a little bit more carefully. So if we analyze it and put it into logical form, then there is a major premise, which is something like this. If we are to believe that God exists, then he should show himself to us. Um, then there's an implied negation of the second part. In logic, we call that the, uh, the consequent. We negate the consequent, and, uh, and the implication is that he does not show himself to us. And the conclusion, implied conclusion is, therefore, we will not believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. Now, um, as I'm saying this, you, I'm sure that you can see that this is completely incompatible with this verse of the Qur'an. It's completely incompatible with The way in which this question is posed, the logical argument that is behind it, um, it comes from, uh, where does this question come from? Why does this question even come to our minds? It comes to our minds because we live in an age where um, uh, where where um, there is a phenomenon called new atheism, um, atheism based on scientific belief and other uh, other concepts. Um, this atheism is called new atheism, but in reality, there's nothing new about it. Everything that they say has already been said before and already been answered before thousands of years ago. Um, it, it was said to every prophet, and every prophet he responded to these questions. Um, so, uh, so, but the problem with many of these questions that are posed by the new atheists is not, doesn't lie in the question. The problem lies in the way that they ask the question. The question is often when, uh, when, uh, when we hear, as Muslims, we hear these questions, um, we, we, uh, we find within these questions a spirit of um, rebellion against 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A spirit of rudeness almost to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And often we find it difficult to even say the question. But nevertheless, these questions are there. We find them in the media. We find them uh, everywhere. People are, there's books that are published. And so since questions like this are posed, they come into our minds and then they become questions in our minds. So when we ask these questions, we probably don't ask them in that same spirit. But it's important for us to step back and uh, and uh, and understand the spirit in which the questions were originally asked in order for us to understand how to answer that question. So this question, as I said, it's nothing new. There were similar questions that were asked before in the Quran. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ يَا مُوسَى لَنْ نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى نَرَى اللَّهَ جَهْرَةً In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, he speaks to the children of Israel, um, the descendants of Sayyidina Yaqub alayhi salam, the 12 tribes of, uh, of Israel. He speaks to them, the people of scripture, the people of the book, and he reminds them. He says, remember when you said to Sayyidina Musa, the prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Moses, we will not believe in you until we see Allah with our naked eyes. The verse continues to say that then a lightning bolt struck you and you fell down dead. And then as a favor upon you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrected you and gave you another chance so that you could show gratitude. So the question here is, so what I want to note is that, that I want you to note is that here, there, here's a people who lived thousands of years ago and they're asking a very similar question. They're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show himself to them. And I also want you to note how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did to them when they asked this question. They were punished. They were punished, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still gave them another chance. But why were they punished? They were punished, the Mufassir would say, because they asked this question out of stubbornness. The children of Israel, when they asked this question, what had they seen before they asked this question? They had seen the miraculous drowning of uh, Fir'aun with their own eyes. The sea had been parted. They had gone through the sea and then the sea had collapsed upon Fir'aun and he had drowned before them. And imagine how they would have felt when uh, you know they, they, there's this tremendous fear of a people who have enslaved them and tortured them and killed them on the verge of grasping them again and putting them back into their slavery and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroys them all before their very eyes miraculously. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed them the miracles of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. In many riwayas, uh, many transmissions uh, of the Mufassirun, the scholars of tafsir, they mention that Allah, subha that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he spoke to Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam and they asked to, to hear the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And according to some riwayas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave them to hear the speech, his speech uh, directly. Um, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a sound. Uh, it's not something that is, resembles anything in creation. Um, it is something exalted. We can't understand what it is. But it is, it is something that's there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reveal it to whoever he wills of his slaves. So um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he showed them all of these signs. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and despite all of these signs, when they, said, uh, when they said that we won't believe you until we see Allah with our naked eyes, there is in this request a stubbornness. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals himself to you um, in one way, another way, another way, and you say that I won't believe until it's like this, then this is not an acceptable way to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to accept the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing himself to us and go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his terms, not demand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come to us on our terms. Because as we saw in the first episode, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, لا يسألوا عما يفعل وهم يسألون. He shall not be questioned about what he does, but they will be questioned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolute sovereign. 
master, king of every atom in the universe. We are utterly needy of him. We need to realize this fact. We need to realize this fact. And when we realize this fact, it should humble us and we should be grateful for what the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has showed us, the blessings that he's showered us with and go towards him. He's calling us to his mercy. He's calling us to paradise. He's calling us to forgiveness. To respond in this way is stubbornness. And that's why the children of Israel were struck by a lightning bolt and they all fell down dead. But the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so great that when the Prophet Moses alayhi salam pleaded with him, he still resurrected them and gave them another chance. Another reason why they were punished is that they sought the removal of responsibility. This is a subtle point that I want us to understand. Uh, we'll spend some time on this. But uh, the idea here is that human beings are responsible to believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us responsible to believe in him, to humble ourselves to him, to worship him, to ask him. He's made us responsible to go to paradise. He's made us responsible to seek out what benefits us for eternity. He's made this, he made, he's made all of these things our responsibility. He's told us you must do this. Now, responsibility, we'll see, um, entails the exercise of reason. It entails farsightedness. It entails um, making good choices. And, um, and, uh, you know, and, and these are all things that human beings can do because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given human beings an intellect. And, uh, and responsibility, uh, it does not uh, fit with, uh, with, so, for example, um, if I am, uh, if I'm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for, made it forbidden uh, for me to, uh, to insult um, any human being. And so if I go and I intend to insult a human being and suddenly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates a massive blazing fire before me to stop me from insulting another human being, then uh, regardless of whether I'm a responsible person or not a responsible person, regardless of whether I'm a good person or a bad person, I won't insult the human being, this other human being. But if that does not happen, and he tells me that if I insult this human being in this life, then in the next life I will be punished. And, uh, and there's a distance. There's a distance, but there's signs. There's signs that are given to show that this is something that's true. Um, and I, I can reflect on it. And I, I now I have to be farsighted. This is where, uh, this, is, this, is, this is what is needed in order for responsibility to be realized. And so when, uh, when, the, when the children of Israel, they asked this question, they were asking for the removal of their responsibility. They wanted, they wanted, they, and this is similar to the idea that I just said a little while ago, that they wanted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come to them on their terms, not the other way. So let's uh, return to our uh, argument here. Um, and, you know, as I was writing it down, it was, um, I felt, uh, you know, I felt distasteful. Um, and it's actually distasteful. I find it distasteful to even say this. But as I'm saying this, I'm saying this not on my tongue. I'm saying this on the tongue of someone else. And, um, and so, uh, and I'm trying to explain why it is mistaken. So let's look at this argument. Um, if we look at this argument, uh, and we want to remember, we want to ask our question with sincerity. Um, and, it's, and without stubbornness, without uh, the demands to remove our responsibility to our creator. So if we ask this question in this way, then we will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in fact shown himself to us. He has shown himself to us. How has he shown himself to us? Well, um, uh, everything in the universe needs something to make it the way that it is. The sky needs something to make it blue. The wind needs something to make it blow. The sun needs something to make it shine. The day needs something to make it day. The night needs something to make it night. Everything in the universe needs something to make it the way that it is. Now, when we study, when we study scientific explanations for natural phenomena, these scientific explanations, they are also, um, we call, we, they are also explanations that they need something else to make them the way that they are. So if we say that, um, that, uh, that the night and day 
um, are caused by the rotation of the Earth on its axis. Then we, we ask the question, what makes the Earth rotate? And then if we uh, respond to that by uh, some kind of a theory about how the, uh, the solar system evolved as a spinning disk of gases um, in which, uh, which were orbiting around the sun because of the force of gravity and, uh, and some kind of an explanation like that, everything that we say here will also, uh, it could have been otherwise. What made that the way that it is? This, this argument that I'm elaborating, it's called the argument for the existence of God from contingency. Contingency means neediness. And um, I'm going through it quickly here, but I have another, I have a YouTube uh, video, several YouTube videos as part of another series called Why Islam is True, where I walk you through this argument in considerable detail. And, um, and what we see is that since everything in the universe needs something to make it the way that it is, then, uh, then, the, the, then the things in the universe could only be the way that they are if there was someone who is necessary. There's a necessary being who doesn't need anyone to make him who he is and who makes everything the way that it is. Because contingent explanations are not explanations. If I, if I point at something in the universe, a phenomenon in the universe, and, and say that this phenomenon is the way it is because of uh, some other phenomenon, uh, then I'm not answering the question, I'm just delaying it. I'm passing the buck, I'm, I'm, I'm going to this phenomenon, and, if, and that phenomenon also, I need to ask the same question, and I point to another phenomenon, I'm delaying the question, I haven't answered the question. The things in the universe can only be the way that they are if there is a being who doesn't need anything and everything needs that being. So, uh, so uh, if we, this is why if we look at the universe, we see God everywhere. Who made the sky blue? God did. Who made the wind blow? God did. Who made the day day and the night night? God did. This is one of many arguments for the existence of God. Another argument is the argument from creation. We all believe now that the universe began to exist. It's established scientific fact. If the universe began to exist, it must have been made by someone who did not begin to exist. Same line of reasoning, um, because if the universe was made by, some, by someone who began to exist, then that being would need someone to make him exist, and it would not be a sufficient explanation for the beginning of the universe. So the universe needs to return to someone who is a necessary being who did not begin to exist, upon whom everything else depends, who needs nothing. This is the idea of God. Um, there's also the argument by design, uh, you know, fine-tuning. So God has shown himself to us. So this means that the argument from the outset is wrong. When we say that he does not show himself to us, that's wrong. He has shown himself to us. And if this, uh, so this argument is called the Modus Tollens argument, if A, then B, but not B, therefore not A. So if the, uh, the middle, if the second premise is false, um, uh, then if, 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 uh, if it's not true, if second premise is not true, the conclusion also does not follow. So, uh, so uh, God has shown himself to us. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just show himself to us. He also sent us messengers with clear signs. He sent us the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with many miracles to, to prove the genuineness of his messengerhood. And these miracles have been transmitted in, uh, in large, by large numbers of people in a way that uh, gives us certainty that they did happen. Um, and one of his miracles, the Qur'an, is still before us. The Qur'an is a miraculously eloquent scripture. Its, be its beauty is something that's undeniable, and it's something that we can even, we can experience if we learn the Arabic language. Um, and uh, in hearing it is beautiful. Um, the Qur'an has a power that moves us. We've seen uh, the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged the ancient Arabians who prided themselves on their linguistic abilities to, uh, to bring the like of it. But instead of doing that, they went to war against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They spent their wealth, they lost their sons, they gave their own lives. All of these things testify to their own inability to bring the like of the Qur'an. All of these things are historical fact. And in our times, there is, um, there is also the scientific miracle of the Qur'an, the Qur'an, the way that it speaks of the human, uh, the formation of the human being in the womb of the mother 
it is astounding. Uh, it's not something that could, that anyone knew before the present time. And uh, you know, there's many other facts. The Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He says, "Was Sama He says that the, the heavens we have made them with a great power, and surely we are expanding them. Uh, this is this is also a fact that was only discovered in the last uh, couple of decades. Um, many things, I won't belabor the point, we're all familiar with these things. He sent messengers with clear signs, the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He used to give generously in, in, in Ramadan, he gave more generously than the wind, um, despite the fact that he ended his life as the undisputed ruler of all of Arabia. He continued to live as a slave did. He lived a, uh, he lived, he didn't live a lavish life. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, never hit a thing, never hit a thing. He never hit a woman, he never hit a servant. Um, and the only strike that he made was a strike in battle that was fought, uh, in which people fought against him. And, uh, and he never sought revenge for anything that anyone ever did to him. Um, he was the Prophet وسلم, he forgave. When he came back to Mecca, as uh, and uh, as the, and he took over Mecca, and all of these people who had driven him out attempted to kill him, he told them, "You're free, you're free." He told them that there will be no retribution on you this, this day. This is the character of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as comes out in his seerah and his hadith. This is something that is it's a proof, it's a clear sign. He's not a liar. He's not an imposter. The fact uh, for him to be an imposter does not fit with his life. The Pro Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent us messengers with clear signs to tell us that not only that to not only to tell us that he does exist, but to tell us that we are responsible in believing that he does exist and in confirming his messengers and uh, and uh, and and that and that our eternal fate depends on our showing humility and submission to our Lord in this life. What this means is that the outset of this argument is wrong. The outset of this argument, when we say, if we are to believe that God exists, this is phrased in a way that says that we have a choice. I, if I want to, I'll believe in him. If I don't, I won't. That's true. You do have a choice. And everyone has a choice. God gave us all a choice. But we are also responsible. So, uh, and we're responsible. We are responsible to believe that God exists. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made has made us made it obligatory upon us. So we have the freedom, but we also have the responsibility. And when we and when we uh, if we ask a question with sincerity, then we need to keep in mind that we are responsible to our creator. He created us, he gave us knowledge of him, he sent us messengers, he made us responsible. We are in fact his servants, whether we like it or whether we don't. Um, uh, uh, the uh, in this question, there's also um, a removal of responsibility. Why? Because as I illustrated a little while ago, responsibility entails inference. If um, every time I did something, uh, I was about to disobey God, there was something that came out and uh, so that I could see it with my eyes, then everyone would avoid that. Um, the, the point of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making us responsible is to demonstrate those who deserve paradise and to demonstrate those who don't deserve paradise to show human goodness to distinguish the good from the bad to distinguish those who live their lives for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and between those who live their lives for their own selves so and that's only possible when there's a distance responsibility entails inference responsibility uh, and so since responsibility entails inference it doesn't make sense that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should actually show himself to us for us to see him with our naked eyes um in this there's also um an assumption that god is a physical object god is not a physical object god is the creator of all physical objects we can in fact see allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will in the afterlife inshallah uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all of those who see him in paradise. But that sight will not be like the sight of everything that we see around us. Because God is not a physical object. He does not exist in place. He does not exist in time. He doesn't have a direction. It's a completely different experience. And uh, and when and the person who poses this question, he um, assumes that, uh, that he's making the implicit assumption that God is just like everything else in the, uh, in the universe.
universe. And just as in the universe, I, I only, I, you know, there's, a, you know, I, I have experiment and I, uh, I observe things. That that's the way that God is known. That's not the way that God is known. God is known through the mind. He's known through the mind. You look at the world around you and you use your mind and you can see God through the world. The world is entirely dependent on God. If God was not there, the world would not be there. Responsibility entails inference. It entails farsightedness. It entails good choices. You infer, you're far, far, farsighted, you make a good choice. Um, if you're forced to make to do something because the hellfire suddenly appears before you, just before, just before you do uh, a bad action, then there's no difference between you and an animal. Um, animals, by instinct, they avoid, uh, they avoid things, they avoid manifest harm. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us responsible. And responsibility entails inference, farsightedness, good choices, and consequences. And, uh, and the messengers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to us told us that there would be consequences if we make bad choices. So um, if we uh, return to our question, uh, we want to, let's look at this question. If God exists, why doesn't he show himself to us? We want to ask this question with sincerity. We want to ask this question in the spirit of you alone do we worship and your help alone do we seek. So we need to, let's step back from this question and write down a number of, take note of a number of points. The first point is that God has showed us that he exists. The second is that he has made us responsible. Just like these, uh, responsible to do what? Responsible to do what these circles of worshippers are doing around the Kaaba, to worship him, to, be, to humble ourselves to him, to, uh, to place our needs at his door so that he can fulfill our needs and give us everything that we ever imagined. Um, the question is actually not uh, if God exists, why doesn't he show himself to us? The question is that he does exist, he has shown himself to us, he has made us responsible. Why don't we humble ourselves to him? That's the real question. So, um, uh, so that's uh, uh, that, that that's brings us to the end of this episode. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, here's a question. It says, um, uh, "Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh." What are signs that one's Iman or Tawbah is accepted by Allah? How can we know for certain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with us? Um, so we, the ulama, they tell us that we live between fear and hope. And our fear and hope need to be balanced. So we have to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, comes from the fact that we are uh, we don't give him his due. And, but we also have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he is most forgiving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he begins, he mentions, he begins every surah in the Quran except one with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, the most merciful, the most compassionate. The, uh, the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is everywhere in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, um, he uh, he tells us um, that uh, he tells us uh, the Prophet Sallallahu told us that Allah Subhanahu that if, if you weren't to commit sins, then uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala would create a people who would disobey Him so that they could repent, so that He could forgive them. So um, so what we what we do is um, what we we uh, when uh, whenever we commit a sin, and all of us commit sins, and I commit sins, and every single human being except the prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made them and they will have missteps, they will have sins. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to make a tawbah. He created us so that we could repent to him. Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam, he came down to earth through a tawbah. And through his tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him to the highest of levels. So, um, uh, so what we, uh, so what we, uh, uh, our iman, is um, iman is something that is is uh, is um, is definitely accepted by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, um, uh, and a tawbah that is made sincerely is definitely accepted by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So we should have a good opinion of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. 
um, without the, the trick is we have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without becoming overconfident. Um, so uh, we, we're humble and we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need to punish us, that he loves to forgive. And with that, we move forward. The danger comes when one uh, comes in two areas. The first area in which the danger comes is in, uh, is in uh, becoming overconfident. Uh, by uh, saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive me whatever I do and so I can do whatever I want. There's something wrong here. There's no fear. And there's also danger in the other side, which is a common phenomenon now in our times, uh, and which is that I'm no good. Allah will never forgive me. I've done something so bad that, uh, that, uh, that I don't deserve to be forgiven. This is, this is, to have this mindset is haram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden us from thinking in this way. So somebody who says that I've done something so bad that Allah will never forgive me, that this is actually an accusation against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to forgive. So what we do practically, what we do is we have humility and we repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have a good opinion of him. We believe that he loves to forgive and we believe that he doesn't need to forgive us, uh, he doesn't need to punish us, that he loves to forgive us and we believe that he is most merciful and we believe that he will forgive us and we uh, and we move forward uh, with that um uh, another question um, the new atheist ploy is more an emotional appeal than a logical one this is how they sow doubts how does one deal with the former logical argument isn't enough it seems um uh, yeah, I agree with you. It's more emotional than logical. However, it comes in the guise of a logical argument. So it comes in the uh, in the it comes. There's a claim that's made that it's logical. There's a claim that's made that it's that the, that is based on argument, um, and and so part of uh, you know part of responding to the ploy is to actually take the claims and. And, and unpack their, uh, you know, their, their logical underpinnings and show that they're false logically. So using the mind to, uh, to show that there's no uh, logical argument there, it helps us, uh, it helps us, uh, uh, it helps us see, um, see the falsehood for what it is. Um, often the emotional pressure comes from the imagination that there is actually an argument. Um, yeah, there's other kinds of emotional pressures that we'll, uh, in, in, in the future episodes, we'll have a, we'll have a look at them, uh, a couple of these ones. Any other questions? Okay, so I will stop here. Uh, see you all tomorrow. Uh, uh, tomorrow's uh, question uh, will be the question for tomorrow will be that uh, uh, you know why did God create us and then send us to the hellfire? And that's a common question that uh, that uh, is uh, is posed. So inshallah, come back tomorrow. We will we'll look at that question. وهو حسبنا ونعم الوكيل السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته